Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the editor in chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Rob Aitken, an ARM fellow, and we're going to talk today about what it takes to actually implement near threshold computing from an architect and a design engineer standpoint. So if I'm going to architect a system to work in this case, essentially what I'm thinking of for, for a typical leaf node, I may want to have a sensor of some kind. I'll have a radio for this thing to communicate and I'm going to have some kind of processing that happens on the, uh, the, the data that comes from the sensor and I'm going to need some kind of a battery. So from an architecture standpoint, I want to think about how these objects interact with each other, whether or not I need some you know, long-term code storage and this kind of thing as well. But mostly what I want to make sure is that there's some kind of an overall control scheme such that the sen whatever data comes from the sensor is processed to the extent that it needs to be and then sent out on the radio and that whatever instructions this object needs come in through the radio, go to the processor, and then that gets told to the sensor and so on. The battery is important to consider because the battery has a couple of properties that are important. Number one, it has a finite energy supply, as we've talked about. It also has a voltage and current profile that changes as the battery ages. So as it runs out of charge, it's going to behave differently. The profile of what that looks like is important when you're thinking about the power management. And also, some of these components, especially the analog components, will not like operating at near threshold type voltages. So because they don't want to operate down that low, it means that there will be multiple voltages inside this system, which means that there's an entire regime of power regulation that exists here. So we will have multiple power regulators lurking connected to the battery in order to provide the voltages that the radio wants, the voltage that the sensor wants, as well as this sort of near threshold voltage the processor can use. What does it mean for the design engineer who really has to get down to the nitty gritty of all these details? Right, so for the design engineer standpoint, then we really have what amounts to a control um, IC or SOC chip here, and it's gonna have a processor here and it's going to have some kind of power management here and buses and so on and um, some periphery over here. So from the chip designer, now we have to think about how we're going to put all, how we're going to provide all of these blocks and there's a couple of key pieces to it that we're really going to have to think about. So we need to think about the, the memories the clocking, the power gating, and then yeah, and then the, the last one is essentially the the voltage distribution. So once we've, we've made the decision to operate at a near threshold type voltage, the very first thing that we need to think about is the memory. The reason that we need to think about that is that a typical memory that comes as part of a foundry process will not operate in the near threshold regime. So if that is important to us, if it's important to have the memory operate at a low voltage, then we actually need a custom memory. So we will what's, what's the reason for that? Is that because it just takes a certain amount of energy to keep the charge and keep it uh, functioning, or is it something else? It's, it's actually the, the stability of the bit cells. So when you design a bit cell, it's important to trade off the, the area, the power, the access time, and the, the overall stability. And most foundry bit cells were not designed to operate in this regime, and so as you lower a six transistor bit cell as you lower the VDD becomes unstable and signal to noise margin goes essentially to zero. So in order to get below say 600 millivolts ish operating voltage you need to augment the design and typically that's done by adding what are essentially digital read ports so separating the read and the write function inside the memory possibly separating those from the storage node 
So you go from having a six transistor cell up to an eight transistor cell or a 10 transistor cell that allows you to operate at these lower voltages. As you can imagine, that is a lot of complexity. So if you're not, if you don't have a whole lot of SRAM on the chip and if you're not that um, ambitious, you may want to just use a foundry cell, keep it at a higher voltage, and then use level shifters to talk to it. So that's one of the first design decisions that you need to make when you're operating in this regime. The next thing to think about is clocking. And the reason that you need to think about it is when you lower the voltage on anything, the delay go increases, as we've seen earlier, but the variability of the delay increases more. So if you look at, let's draw a little clock tree here. If we have a clock tree, in a nominal voltage clock tree, this branch here may just do, be due to RC delays and the device sizing here. We can have these two points here, A and B, as being roughly the same delay to get to them. As we drop the voltage, though, the uncertainty in the gate delay goes up much, much faster than the uncertainty in the wire delay. And as a result, this point here can move around quite a bit, and this one here, because it's got four of these delays, can move around even more. And we wind up with a clock tree that's vastly out of balance, and that the tools that we're using to build our clock tree don't realize are out of balance. And so what we found is that in general, for building a near threshold clock tree, you want to keep the number of levels balanced. So even if the tool thinks that it's balanced one with five levels and one with three levels, we want to tell the tool, no, don't do that, make everything five levels. So clocking is a really critical aspect of low voltage operation. The next thing that we need to think about is we need to think about power gating. And the reason that we want to do that is that we probably, in or, one of our assumptions has been that this device shuts off and sleeps. And if the power is not gated off while it's doing that, it will be leaking the whole time, which means that this min energy curve that we drew earlier won't apply and it will be much, much leakier than we really want it to be. And so in order to do that, we need to distribute our power gates and we need to, we need to place them and so on. We, could, we can draw that on this picture here. We have these different components that are on here, and we need to place our power gates somewhere. So here's a block, say. We will need to place power gates not just at the periphery. We'll need to distribute them throughout the design, something like this. And then we'll may have a different block over here. It needs some power gates. And our power management unit that was down here, and we can put it back. It needs to control when these ones get switched and when these ones get switched. So there's a, there's a floor planning aspect of that and there's a number of power gates aspect. Both of those are important because I need to place these correctly, but I also want to place the right number of them. If I have too few power gates, then what happens is my design is current starved when it's running. As a result, the IR drop will be bad, the, power, the, the performance will not be what I want it to be. However, if I put too many power gates in there, then I have the opposite problem, which is that when I shut it off, the thing that's leaking is the power gates, and now there are so many power gates that the minimum amount of leakage goes up, which means that I'm, again, missing my min energy point. So there's a, there's a key aspect to that, too. All of these guys collectively, so the, the memory, the clocking, the power gating, all of these collectively work out as part of the library or physical IP that's necessary to support this. We need to think about how, what components we need in here. We also need some level shifters, we need some clamps and so on. And we need these all of these devices to be characterized not just at the main operating point that we want, but also at the lower voltage operating points as well. So the, the library component of this is important. The physical design of the library also turns out to be important. So in order to achieve this min energy point, we actually need to do some custom design of elements such as flip-flops, for example, to make sure that they operate at this low energy point. We don't necessarily have to do as much tweaking to the library as we would have to do to operate in the sub-threshold regime, 
But we still have to think about some of the things like uh, voltage transistor stacks and so on. Okay, and the last one here is voltage distribution, which includes the regulators and includes the various always on domains and so on. And a lot of, the, a lot of this stuff for the, the distribution of regulators and so on has been solved as part of the low power design efforts that have gone on for the last decade. And so standards like IEEE 1801 and so on and the, the tools that support them all help us with the, the placement and distribution of these different voltage domains. So once you get all this done, you've done all this work, you've, you've changed out your memory, you've, you've figured out the clock tree, you've, you've done your power gating, and you've done your uh, characterization of everything and your voltage distribution, how much energy do you actually save out of a good design? Um, if you do the good design, you can actually save this sort of four to six X level of energy. And if you're careful in terms of your power gate placement and your library design, then the overhead that you had to absorb to do that is not as significant as you might think. So you can still, you can still be in the sort of 3 to 5x energy savings. And we've been able to document that on silicon. Which means your battery life lasts, what, multiple times more than it does now? Yeah, roughly 3 to 5x. You, you get roughly 3 to 5x longer battery life.